Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Joe, Tom, Rob, Nathan, Marty, Alan, Douglas, David, Michael, and Bob. Have we got everybody? Okay. Well, I think it's a, it's a great pleasure to have our speaker today. I, I've, I've known of him for some time. Uh, I don't know why I haven't gotten to, to one of the places where he sits, because it's, uh, his uh, reputation has preceded him. Uh, uh, Ms. Cash here is a, 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 a Vipassana teacher, Eugene Cash. He's a, a, he, he conducts a, a, a retreats and speaks uh, at Vipassana uh, activities all over the country. Uh, he has a sitting group here in San Francisco, and uh, um, and also uh, with uh, with Frank Ostasowski. I don't know how many of you know who he is. He works every week at the uh, Zen Hospice, where they have a special sitting group uh, for uh, people with HIV. And uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to enjoy his talk very much. So we'll turn it over to you, Eugene. Yeah. My apologies for being late. It's always an interesting opportunity to practice when you're late. <laughs> there was a period of time in my practice where I was very interested in what did it mean to be impeccable in practice. And so part of what it meant to me was to really, you know, fulfill my commitments as part of my practice, to really be on time. And so I was really working hard on this uh, for a while. And I went to, um, at Spirit Rock, as part of what we do, um, we've been training a number of local people in different communities around the country to be what's called community dharma leaders. Um, so that they're people who lead sitting groups in the various communities where there are no uh, um, lineage holding Dharma teachers in the Vipassana tradition. And so these, uh, there's about 35 people that we've been training over the last two and a half years, and they come twice a year to the Bay Area, and we, and we do a series of teachings and trainings for them. So I was driving up, being impeccable, to get to one of these train. The, I think it was the first training. And um, I got to Spirit Rock, and I I noticed there weren't a lot of cars there. And I thought, maybe I'm really early. And I get in, and I'm saying hi to, to the staff there. And they're like, well, what are you doing here? And I'm like, what do you mean, what am I doing here? Doesn't the community Dharma leaders teaching start today? And they said, oh, yeah, it does. It's at Santa Sabina, which is 20 minutes away. <laughs> and I... And so I went and I showed up and I made my apologies and you know paid attention to being embarrassed and things like that. And then later I was talking with one of the other Vipassana teachers, Mary Orr, and she and I was telling her about you know trying to be impeccable and coming on time and going to Spirit Rock and not being at the right place. And she said, "Oh my dear, you just need uh, to learn how to be impeccably late." <laughs> and it was really it was really a great teacher and it really points to the freedom that's possible in practice that it's not about the circumstances the circumstances aren't what creates freedom it's how we relate to the circumstances and so I'd like to talk to you to, uh, today a little bit reflect with you really uh, and do some question and answer also about the path to freedom. And mindfulness is often called the path to the deathless, which is a euphemism for freedom or nirvana or nirvana in the ancient texts. And at the heart of the Buddha's teachings 
is the teaching of liberation, is the teaching of freedom, sometimes called the sure heart's release, awakening, enlightenment. The Buddha said, just as the great ocean has only one taste, that is the taste of salt, so the teachings have only one flavor, and that's the flavor of freedom. And the Buddha taught in many different ways. When you read the scriptures, when you read the ancient texts, you see that most of his teaching is done uh, either in discourse with people, where he gets up and gives a talk to the monks and nuns or to the lay people, or in dialogue with people, just talking to them, or in a kind of dialogue that's an investigation, an inquiry, or a reflection about life and about freedom and about suffering. And in the scriptures, you, you, there's these great stories where the Buddha gives a discourse and then they say, and 500 people were awakened, or 1,000 people were awakened, or the 80 people who were there were awakened, just by, by hanging around the Buddha and having him talk. And it can happen at any time. So if anybody notices anything, please let me know. <laughs> oh, we're talking. But because some people didn't get it when he just talked, he taught meditation practice. And he gave instructions basically for the rest of us who don't just awaken like that. And the teachings on mindfulness begin with a beautiful paragraph. The Buddha began, he said, O oh monks, there is a most wonderful way to help living beings realize purification, overcome directly grief and sorrow, end pain and anxiety, travel the right path, and realize nirvana. Nirvana. This is the four foundations of mindfulness. I want to say I have a really good typo here I want to share with you, which is, you know, it says, you know, overcome directly grief and sorrow, pain and anxiety, travel the tight path, which is <laughs> not, not what the Buddha said, the right path. <laughs> but sometimes we don't get it right we get kind of tight in our practice so <laughs> actually what he meant by the right path was not right and wrong really what is meant is the direct path that it leads one way it leads to liberation it leads to awakening it doesn't go anywhere else and so it's a beautiful invitation and it's really the Buddha's invitation to us, come practice, come check it out, come see for yourself, which is always the Buddha's teaching, to see for yourself what awakens, what liberates, what illuminates, where is freedom. And so in the Vipassana tradition, the tradition I teach in, which is the oldest uh, teaching, actually one of the one of the translations of Vipassana is the teachings of the elders. Actually, it's the translation of Theravada. This is from the Theravada lineage. And there's uh, three main lineages in Buddhism, the Theravada, the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana, uh, most simply characterized by Southeast Asia being Theravadan, uh, the Japanese, Chinese tradition being Mahayana, and the uh, Tibetan tradition being Vajrayana. And the Theravada is the way of the elders um, by default. The default being after the Buddha died, there were, I think, something like 18 different main sects of Buddhism. And the Theravada is the one that survived. So we ended up being the, the elders. Um, and then the Mahayana and Vajrayana were really uh, developments in Buddhism that came later. And the main practice in the Vipassana tradition is mindfulness meditation. Is, um, it's also known as insight meditation. And it's a very wonderful practice. It's a very simple practice. And it's a very difficult practice. 
at the same time. It's really the practice of being present. And I would like to encourage you to do it right now, to pay attention right now, because that's the whole practice. We don't have to go far away or do even a lot of instruction, but just be here now. So it means paying attention to me somewhat, but it means, I I think, even more paying attention to yourself, paying attention to your body, to your feelings, to your reactions, to your thoughts, to the sounds, to me also. So it's uh, one time the Buddha said it, he said, um, being mindful of the body with its uh, perceptions, the sights and sounds, smells, taste, touch, and the inner sense, the feelings and sensations and the thoughts. And notice what it's like if you, right now, put about um, 70% of your attention on yourself with your eyes open, or as you're listening, you don't have to have your eyes open, do as, as you please, but notice what happens as you orient towards being very present right here as you sit here. And partly I'm just, I like to encourage this because in our tradition, in, in mindfulness, in Vipassana, Um, We sit with our eyes closed generally, and one of the weaknesses of that is people forget, or it's harder to be mindful with one's eyes open. And so I really like to encourage people to keep practicing during the talks, which I'm doing as I'm speaking. I'm doing the same practice, it's kind of 70-30. And as you notice, you can see me and hear me, and it's it's pretty easy. You don't have to do so much. You kind of rest back into this moment's experience as it presents itself in your seat. Now mindfulness, how many people here have practiced mindfulness? Just give me a sense. Okay. So I want to say a little bit about it as a practice. As the Buddha said, this way, this practice of mindfulness, there are four foundations. And these four foundations are really the body, feelings, um, what's, I'm going to be technical here, mental states, and the mind itself, thought. Um, often we present it as breath, body, heart, and mind. It really includes everything in human experience. There's nothing discluded from this practice. And the practice is to be aware and awake of what's happening now. So it's extremely simple. It's extremely uncomplicated in that sense. It's just what's happening now. Oh, there's a breath happening. Can you feel it? Can you experience it? Can you know it in this moment? Not as a thought, not as a memory, not as an idea but directly, immediately, viscerally, kinesthetically. There's a body here. All kinds of sensations are happening. Can you be aware of them? Can you feel the pressure or the tiredness or the coolness or the heat directly, immediately? Not as a memory, not as an idea. The same is true of the emotional life. Bored, excited, interested, peaceful, agitated. Can you be aware of it immediately, directly, feeling it, knowing it? Can you be aware of the mind, the thoughts, without going off with the thought, but aware of thought as thinking, as a process? In the Asian cultures that this practice was taught in and developed, the mind is considered another sense door. So there's the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue. Um, the sm- Let me see if I can get them all. Um, there's smelling, tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, thinking. It's, it's just as if you have an eye, it sees, or an ear hears, 
If you have a mind, it thinks. That's what minds do. And to see that it's a process, and this is a really important piece in mindfulness. Um, one of the great Thai teachers, um, Ajahn Buddhadasa, when asked what he thought of the world, he said three words summed up his whole understanding of the world. Lost in thought. And that really, that's the primary part of our suffering, is that we're lost in the idea of reality. We're lost in our memory of who we are. We're lost in our idea about how it should be. Instead of being right here in this lived, alive, magical, numinous, amazing, simple moment. Whatever it is, even wandering around looking for the Buddhist meditation on Sunday morning, that moment is, is a moment to awaken. So the practice of mindfulness is to open to every realm of experience without judgment, without grasping, without pushing away. And mindfulness is very big. So it means when the judgment's there, we're not even judging the judgment. Then we become mindful of that. When we're confused, then confusion becomes what we're mindful of. So we don't even have to grasp onto clarity. When we're embarrassed, then embarrassment is what's here. And we don't have to grasp onto some idea about how we're supposed to be. And in the practice of mindfulness, we want to pay attention very carefully to what's happening now. One of the Zen teachers, when somebody came to him, a rich man came, wanted to know, tell me the teachings, I really want to know the teachings. And the Zen teacher wrote a calligraphy and he wrote, attention. And the guy said, come on, I've come a long way. I'm going to pay you a lot of money. Give me the teachings. This is, you know, so he wrote, attention, attention. <laughs> and the guy started to really get perturbed. And, you know, I'm not going to pay you anything. And, da, 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 and I'm a very, you know, well-respected man. I want the, the full teaching. He wrote, attention, attention, attention. Pay attention. Actually, how I got lost today was by not paying attention. It was very interesting. It's Sunday morning, and you know, I'm kind of, I'm sure I know where I'm going. That's the first mistake. That was, <laughs> that was the first mistake. I know right where Bartlett Street is. Just go down Valencia and turn right, and it's right there. And I turn right. I'm wearing my sunglasses. I'm not wearing my glasses for reading. And I see a street sign. It says Bartlett, <coughs> I thought. <coughs> and so I park, and I'm walking up and down, and I'm trying to find, I'm thinking, wow, there's no 37 here. you know. And then I go, and I make a call, and finally I drive back, and I see, oh, this is not Bartlett. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> it's that... And, and it's a beautiful example of what happens when we don't pay attention. We don't see clearly. And it happens in a moment. And so the moment calls for us to pay attention. If we want to see clearly, if we want to wake up, we need to see what's actually here. What is this body? What is this heart? What is this mind? What is a moment? <clears throat> in the tradition that I teach in, there, there are three insights that come, sometimes soon, sometimes later for people in practice. They come through paying attention mindfully, fully, directly. And they're called uh, the three characteristics of life. Sometimes I've heard some teachers talk about them as um, the facts of life for adults. And there are these three characteristics are called truths. They're the truths of, of what, of the, of the flavor of life that you can find in any moment, which is suffering, dukkha in that ancient text, impermanence or anatta, 
in the ancient texts. And selflessness, excuse me, uh, impermanence or anicca, and selflessness, or what's called anatta in the texts. That when we pay attention very closely to a moment, to experience, to life, we'll see suffering, we'll see impermanence, and we'll see selflessness. There are also kind of a modern uh, version of this, which is uh, shit happens, everything changes, don't take it personally. And these are very helpful insights to have. To see dukkha, to see suffering, is actually very helpful. People think it's kind of, it can be depressing. And I, I guess it can at times. It can, it's sad. It's definitely sad. But it also can be liberating to see suffering and the truth of suffering because then we can begin to see what's not suffering. The same with impermanence. Everybody here knows the truth of impermanence. Anybody here doesn't know that? I mean, you know. And yet, how much do we let it impact us? How much do we let it really affect us? How much do we live our lives from that truth? Because it can be quite freeing to live our lives from that truth. To see that there is nothing that's going to stay the same. Nothing. I find it stunning, actually, still, that there's nothing that's going to stay. Buildings, people, everything, community, everything. It all comes and goes. It's the truth of impermanence. When we see we are that truth, there can be a way we can really relax into that reality. It can be quite free. Selflessness is the one characteristic people have the most trouble with. I mean, most people, you tell them about suffering, they said, yep, I've suffered. There is suffering. I see that truth. Most people, you say, okay, impermanence, everybody gets, at least intellectually, that everything changes. <clears throat> Selflessness, at least if you're like me, when I first came to practice, I said, you, you got to be kidding. I went to my teacher, Joseph Goldstein, and I said, you mean to tell me there's no Joseph Goldstein? And he said, well, yeah, there's no Joseph Goldstein. And there is Joseph Goldstein, but also there's not Joseph Goldstein. And it's, we could do a number of talks in and of itself about selflessness. But one simple way to play with it, to reflect on it, is if you see the truth of impermanence, if you really see that everything's changing, if you pay attention, if you sit for an hour or a week or a month and really pay attention to your body and all the changing sensations or your feelings and all the changing moods and emotions that come or your mind, just all the changing thoughts that happen, where are you in all of that? If everything's changing, where's the solid sense itself? It's just the concept, Eugene. A really good concept. But just the concept. And so, to understand the truth of selflessness doesn't mean Eugene disappears or that there's just a void. It just means there's not so much attachment to the idea of Eugene. The Buddha said, nope, he didn't say that. He said this. He says, luminous is this mind, shining, brightly shining, but it is colored by the attachments that visit it. This unlearned people do not really understand, and so they do not cultivate the mind. They do not practice meditation. They do not try to awaken. Luminous is this mind, brightly shining, and it is free of the attachments that visit it. This the noble follower of the way really understands, and for them there is cultivation of the mind. Now he's using mind in a big M sense, not in the small sense of the thinking mind. He's talking about the mind that realizes the truth, that is realized. 
that is realized through non-attachment. Jack Cornfield, when he uh, came back from Asia, Jack's the senior teacher at Spirit Rock and one of my teachers, he wrote a book called Living Buddhist Masters. I think it's something now called, it's been reprinted called Living Dharma because many of these men have succumbed to the truth of impermanence and are not living Buddhist masters anymore. Uh, <laughs> that's the way it goes. But he wrote this whole chapter called The Entire Teaching, which I'm going to give you now. Ready? Listen up. I reserved the whole chapter to make a simple statement. The entire teaching of Buddhism can be summed up this way. Nothing is worth holding on to. If you let go of everything, objects, concepts, teachers, Buddha, self, senses, memories, life, death, freedom, let go and all suffering will cease. The world will appear in its pristine, self-existing nature and you will experience the freedom of a Buddha. The rest that follows in this book are useful approaches and techniques to learn to let go. It's a thick book, too. <laughs> and if you go into any bookstore now, and I think I look like there was a little bookstore out here even, maybe. There are a lot of books, and they're all pointing. They're all fingers pointing at the moon of letting go. And so mindfulness meditation, which first teaches us how to pay attention to things. That's not the goal. The goal is not just to pay attention. The goal is freedom, is to wake up, is to see what's true. To see directly, immediately, not as an idea, but really know this in the sense of gnosis. You know, it's a full body, heart and mind knowing that actually we can't hold on to anything. And the freedom that comes with that, with non-attachment, <clears throat> letting go of craving, of clinging, of grasping, really letting go and seeing what's here. And one of the key pieces about this is you can't do it. You can't do it. I, I personally can't let go. When I make an effort to let go, that doesn't work. I, my effort, my determination is to pay attention and be present. The letting go actually happens on its own. It's, it's a little magical. When I try to let go, it's, it's like pushing away, which is also a form of grasping in Buddhism. So it's very important to get that. Especially in Vipassana, we talk about um, grasping or clinging in two forms, this way or this way. Either reaching for something or pushing away for something is both grasping. And to learn to just sit, to just be with things as they are, they self-liberate. They let go of whatever it is on their own. We have to be willing to sit there with the pain of it or the fear of it or the difficulty or the joy of it or whatever it is. That's our job, is to actually be present and see what happens. And if we do that, then we see attachment and non-attachment and the great freedom in non-attachment. William Blake said it this way. I think it really sums up the teaching on attachment and non-attachment. He said, He who binds himself to a joy does the winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. Should I say that once more? Yes, so, he who binds himself to a joy, he who clings to a joy, could be a sorrow either. He who clings to a joy or tries to push away a sorrow does the winged life destroy. There's always life here. There's this amazing life as long as we're breathing. And if we cling to it or push away, we miss something of it. But he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. That when we can allow life to live through us, we begin to touch freedom. 
Vipassana, maybe I said at the beginning, is sometimes known as the path to the deathless. And I, I, I think of that when I read Blake, Blake talking about living in eternity's sunrise. It's the joy of simply being alive here and now with whatever comes, being lost, wandering around, embarrassed, the whole show. Not that it's got to be one way. It won't be. People sometimes have the misunderstanding that freedom means no pain. It means no suffering. There's still pain. If you have a body and a heart and a mind, you know, give it up, basically. There's, there's going to be problems. How you relate to the problems? Do you grasp or push away? How do you relate to the joys? Do you grasp or push away? And people do either with either. And in this letting go of the judgment of craving or clinging, this allows us to realize freedom, openness, the ease of the Buddha's teachings. Stephen Batchelor says this, he says, this sudden gap in the rush of self-centered compulsion and fear allows us to see with unambiguous immediacy and clarity the transient, unreliable, and contingent nature of reality. i read that again. This sudden gap, in, when, when letting go, presents itself. In the rush of self-centered compulsion and fear allows us to see with unambiguous immediacy and clarity, vividly, uh, kinesthetically, directly, the transient, impermanent, unreliable, suffering, and contingent, selfless nature of reality. And we discover the freedom of non-clinging. One more piece from Stephen Batchelor. He says, when we realize the cessation from craving or clinging or grasping or aversion or pushing away, we actually allow things to be as they are, here and now. We touch that dimension of experience that is timeless. It then becomes the eternal now. The playful, unimpeded contingency of things emerging from conditions only become conditions for something else. This is also one of the ways we talk about um, impermanence. When you, if you do a long Vipassana retreat at some point, and the mind starts to get really collected and calm, quiet, one of the teacher will ask you to pay attention to impermanence. And one of the things you'll start seeing is everything starts disappearing. You take a step and, wow, it's gone. Or your breath comes and it's gone. Or sound comes and it's gone. And you can really, it starts to get very vivid. And then you see, it's not exactly it's gone, but it also changes into the next moment. So that there's a condition, there's a feeling, and I, there's a little anxiety, and you stay with that for a while, and whoa, it turns into fear. And then fear turns into terror. And terror turns into shaking. And then something lets go. And then it turns into relief. And then peace comes, it turns into peace. And then, whoa, I like the peace, it turns into joy. And then joy turns into, oh, I want it to stay, there's clinging again. And you see that things are just changing, becoming the next moment. Conditions conditioning the next moment. The playful, unimpeded contingency of things emerging from conditions only to become conditions for something else. This is emptiness. Not a cosmic vacuum, but the unborn, undying, infinitely creative dimension of life. Emptiness is not a void. Emptiness is not empty. It's full. It's full of all of this. Because this is all empty, right here and now. It is known as the womb of awakening. It's a beautiful phrase. It is the clearing in the still center of becoming. 
the track on which the centered person moves. It whispers, realize me. So I'll stop here. We give some time for questions or reflections or reactions or epiphanies, small enlightenments. And I, what I tried to do here was just give you a, a very quick, simple overview of mindfulness and the path to freedom from the Vipassana perspective. And I don't know, there's only a couple, one, maybe one or two people here from my sitting group, but just so you know, what I do is I'll make some time for questions, and if nobody raises their hand, I'll start calling out people. So <laughs> it adds a little juice to the, to the situation. Please. One thing that came up to me when you were talking about the truth of uh, Anicca. Anicca? The impermanence? Yes. Just what arose out of was a, uh, a saying in the Bible where Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And I just wondered what you would how you would react to that. Not that I'm <laughs> discerning one thing or the other, that's just half the problem. Well, my, I'll just say my reaction to it is that what I would imagine he meant is the essence of his teaching will never pass away. And the teachings of freedom or of compassion. Yeah, but the Dharma is here, if, even if we never say a word. The Dharma, the truth is here. If we realize it or not is another question, but it's here. Please. I want to thank you for being here. I'm, I'm just in the past month or so, I've started reading A. H. Almas, who I understand is one of your teachers. Yeah. And just this morning, I ran across something about that word, and he pointed out that in the beginning of the Bible, it says, "In the beginning was the word," mm -hmm. and he remarks that words are just concepts. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> word is the first concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Buddhism has a sort of a reputation in America for asceticism or being away from things, and I think we give that through our retreats, and they look from the outside like it's a retreat from life. And I was thinking, of, I, mean, I agree, agree with everything you said, wonderful teaching, but, you know, sometimes I think the emphasis gets misbalanced mis, uh, in the sense that you're, you are here to experience life fully, mm -hmm. and you can if you do it mindfully, mm -hmm. but I, I don't see that message maybe mm -hmm. as strong in Buddhism to say, you know, it's great to go dancing, mm -hmm. dancing is wonderful, mm -hmm. music is wonderful, mm -hmm. and relationships are wonderful and so on. The Buddha didn't say And Buddha didn't say that, <laughs> right. But but I think we sometimes give a mis a misbalanced uh, message to people mm -hmm. who are saying, gee, this sounds like it's just a retreat mm -hmm. uh, from life mm -hmm. rather than embracing of life. Mm -hmm. and so I almost would like to see more Zorba the Greek mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and Buddhist uh, in the way we, we mm -hmm. promote Buddhism in America. Mm -hmm. Or uh -huh. uh, I think there's some real truth to what you're saying about how Buddhism's been presented. It makes sense historically that um, because it comes from a monastic tradition and that the senior Western teachers all went and studied in Asia and in the monastic tradition, that that was the first flavor of how it got presented, and it's changing. I, I had a lovely talk with Ajahn Sumedho, who may be the senior Western uh, Dharma teacher in my tradition. He's uh, an American man who's he's probably been practicing 40 or 45 years now. He's 65, and he, uh, he went to Asia as a young man. And um, he said all he wanted to do was sit in a cave and meditate. And his teacher wouldn't let him do it. He kept making him do community practice. And he said he hated it. 
he hated it because it brought up all these emotions and there were all these monks who didn't practice well or he had judgments about or he had reactions to. And he said he had a really hard time with that. And he said he's so grateful now that his teacher made him do that because he said it taught him to open to the full range of his humanness. And he was so sweet. He was, he was so, he had a smile. It seemed like it was this big. Really, I, I, he would his smile would just come off his face, and um, and he just talked about embracing our humanity fully. That that's the path, and that's the only path. And there is no way to freedom without embracing our humanity, which includes dancing or singing or whatever joy there is in life. And there's lots of joy in life, actually. Um, the caveat, though, is. we still need to practice. But you could go around saying, uh, and I do this sometimes, oh, I'm just being mindful everywhere. And then I go sit for a while, and I think, whoa, man, I haven't been mindful at all. I've been saying I've been mindful. There's different levels of attention. And it behooves us to cultivate, not, not to leave the world, but to actually be in the world. And so in that sense, I love the, the uh, Zen model of, um, you know, coming back to the marketplace with what they call bliss-bestowing hands or gift-bestowing hands, which are the fruit of practice. But the Zen guys who I read about or who I know who've done that, they practice seriously for 10, 12 years, and then they came back. And I'm not saying you have to go away for 10 or 12 years. I'm just saying practice. I think it's, it's really important to practice and uh, include all of life. And it it is the Western contribution. We're going to include dancing, sexuality, whatever it is, we're going to include it. Cars, you know, I mean, we're going to include it. And discover how to awaken in this life now. It's a really important piece for us. I I came across a uh, Tibetan monk on this uh, going swimming and I was uh, taking off my clothes to uh, take a shower and I noticed that he was very, very uh, careful to be uh, modest to them, not appearing naked in you know, the group. And I was wondering if, I could, uh, if you could uh, explain it to me because I don't understand that. So I, I don't know exactly the Tibetan monastic tradition. I do know the Theravada monastic tradition. And I did go swimming once with a Theravada monk. I, I swam in the bay for many years down here at Aquatic Park. And uh, I got a call one night. A friend said, he said, we're bringing Ajahn Amaro to swim at 5 in the morning. Can you come? I said, I'll be there. And so I went down. And they, he's coming at 5 in the morning because he wanted to be there when there were no women there first of all, because of his modesty. And then we swam, and he had, we had a great time, nice cold morning, you know, 5 a.m. in the bay. And, um, and then we, we go in the shower and the sauna. This is the plus part of that. And uh, Jan Amaro keeps his little, I forget the Indian word, doity. Um, you know, it's like a, like a um, diaper. On. And it's his modesty. And it's, it's in the monastic rules. There are like 277 rules that you follow as a monastic. And it's a discipline. It's simply that. And it's a discipline that supports one's awakening in that tradition, in the monastic tradition. And there's all kinds of rules. And they're all to protect people um, so they don't get distracted from their goal, in some sense. And the, 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 the rules around sexuality are amazingly bizarre and uh, complicated. I mean, there's rules about not having sex with corpses, and there's rules... I mean, and you know why the rules came about, don't you? Because <laughs> people were doing it. <laughs> so... Um, it's just part of a certain tradition, lineage, culture, also. Um, you know, the, the way the rule translates as lay people is don't harm through sexuality. 
That's the precept that we take in the Theravada tradition. They're precepts of non-harming. So around sexuality, it's don't cause suffering to someone else through your sexual expression. Don't cause suffering to yourself through your sexual expression. Don't cause suffering to a third party through your sexual expression. So I don't know if that exactly answers your question, just to give you a little flavor of it. I have the seventy percent of me that was listening to you. <laughs> I mean, it was not listening. Yeah. I was paying attention to my body. And I hope you're right now too. You're seventy yeah. percent. I'm a little conscious that I'm not talking. <laughs> That's I'm not so uh, Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> Is uh, uh, I've been uh, I've been well in and out of practicing for ten years. I do it. I don't do it. I do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm in a. a you know, I'm in a very uh, gray place right now. I am, I simply can't listen to the news. Mm-hmm. The suffering in Kosovo is just mm-hmm. overwhelming me. Mm-hmm. I'm, I do volunteer work in a prison, uh, and it's hard to go because of the, the, the uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, I teach yoga and, uh, and both of do meditation and then share. You know, just being with all the suffering there, and it's uh, uh, and I'm just in a very gray and sad, and things are never going to get better, and the world sucks, and uh, um, twice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, that's what came up for me as you were talking. You know, I wasn't feeling joy. At mm-hmm. When the hell is this goddamn practice going to release me from? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know that I can't have a contract. But I just I don't know if you could associate that. All this suffering is going on around. Sure. So I think it's a really important point you're making, which is there are cycles in practice. And sometimes you're at this part of the cycle, and sometimes you're at this part of the cycle. Sometimes one is extremely inspired in practice. Sometimes one's not. A um, few things, a few responses. One is um, it's important to learn how to inspire oneself. And that uh, takes some effort whether it's books or through the arts, I find very inspiring. Music, movies, dance, theater, the world of creativity. Don't don't just look for the Dharma in the formal Dharma. It's everywhere. Other people who are inspiring, friends, sangha, community, for me also very inspiring. Um, Also knowing that there are fallow periods, and that's part of any practice, whether it's meditation practice or um, if you're a writer or any work you're in, there are periods that are really inspired and periods that are more fallow. Um, For me also, if I'm really in an uninspired period, if I go on retreat, it's very helpful to to, to, to sit with it, to sit with the sadness, the suffering, and really pay attention to it. Because often what I find, for me, happening is there'll be a lot of suffering around and I'm actually a little cut off from it. It's both sad and and I'm not right in the middle of it. I'm not sitting right in the middle of it. If I sit right in the middle of it, it's, it's more painful and more free. It's the, it's the aversion to actually fully embracing it that I find the hardest. Um, so the two things, inspiration is important, and, and knowing how to cultivate it is an important part of practice, because there are going to be fallow periods. And then also um, really seeing if you can come closer to the suffering or the pain that you're feeling. Not having to push it away or judge it, it's not bad practice. You know, this is the first noble truth in Buddhism, there is suffering. And our job is to understand it. That's the, the, the Buddha's first teaching after his awakening. It's the Four Noble Truths. We have time for one more Okay. Question. Please. Um, I, I was responding to uh, Don responding to you. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I uh, have also felt totally overwhelmed by the uh, 
and press on us of what's going on in Yugoslavia. And so I have been purposely not dealing with it. Yesterday, I took a walk and sat at the lake and found that I was sitting between two men from Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. from Bosnia, mm -hmm. who did not speak English, mm -hmm. but who offered me part of their lunch. Mm -hmm. And I thought, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, you find it where you find it. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I think the thing that John brings up is, and I find myself thinking when yours come up, is um, here I was pushing it away, and here I found it, mm -hmm. and how nice that was. Mm -hmm. But he didn't seem to me to react badly to the fact that he was Yugoslavian, mm -hmm. and um, wasn't that nice. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I didn't, and that was nice. Mm -hmm. But but how do you how where is somehow where is that line of attention between pushing it off? sitting with it. Can you help on that at all? In, in these, in, when we're going through things like that are sort of bigger than we are. It's a very interesting piece for us. You know, 2,500 years ago, they didn't have mass media. So if you were in the forest, that was the world that you knew. And we sit here and we know the whole world, the whole world's suffering. Uh, it's daunting. I don't think we have to be bravado about it. I think it is daunting. Joanna Macy is one of the best teachers I know in terms of this piece. She calls it um, holding, holding your gaze, just being willing to look at it, just being willing to look and pay attention to your reactions, to the sadness, to the helplessness, to the hopelessness that comes. That's the practice at that level. And then see what happens, because everything changes. It won't usually stay at that place. But we have to be willing to start where we are, to start with just what our reaction is. And she's someone who goes to places like this and just sits there and then finds a response that comes. She doesn't make it up. She sits first with the suffering, and the response comes. Um, and it's not easy. And so again, we don't have to, it's not a macho thing. It's not like, okay, we're going to go do it. It's like we do the best we can. You know, I mean, just reading the headlines. That's enough. It's enough for me personally. Uh, the details, it's very painful. And then to see what happens from just knowing that much. Or however, whatever depth that you involve yourself. And it's different for each person here. Thank you. Thank you. We have a reflection. Okay, could we sit for one minute? Yes. Okay. I'd just like to sit with you for one minute. Um, it could be formal or informal. You don't have to do much and offer the merit of our practice here together. May it be a benefit to all beings, in all directions, in all worlds. May all beings, including ourselves, be happy and peaceful. May all beings, including ourselves, be free from suffering. Be free from harm. May all beings everywhere awaken. Ding. Thank you all for having me. It's been lovely to be here with you again. <laughs> My apologies for being late. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast 
like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org. <laughs>